Thank you, Lord, for the vibrancy that is in this class this morning. Um, Lord, whenever the Holy Spirit is in attendance, we know it. You can feel it if you're looking for it. Um, and that is something we should look for every Sunday we're here. Um, and, and as well in the sanctuary, the, the Holy Spirit will come and join us in our worship. Um, help us to anticipate that. Help us the moment we will walk through that door to look forward to it. All these things, Lord, are, are things that as your children we are to do. And we are to care about. We are to be interested in. Um, Lord, there are a number of um, physical problems here, physical issues, both um, praises and concerns. Um, and we can multiply that probably by a million throughout the rest of the, um, the church worldwide and just people worldwide. Uh, and it's an amazing thing when we stop to consider that you are on top of each and every one. Um, and we praise you for that. Uh, help us to uh, teach your word and your word only. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we left off. Do you recall um, Jesus and the boys, um, Peter, James, and John had been up on Mount Hermon. We believe Mount Hermon. Uh, there had been the transfiguration. They came down off the mountain and there was a crowd that went running to Jesus and said, oh, there's a there's a thing going on down here. Uh, I brought my son to your disciples, and your disciples couldn't hear, uh, could not heal him. And Jesus, out of frustration, coming down, said, "How long am I going to have to bear with you? How long am I going to have to deal with this? Bring the boy to me." And uh, Jesus took care of them. And afterwards, um, or during at the end when the the man came and told Jesus about his son um, Jesus said if you can believe all things are possible to him that believes um, on the surface obviously I, I agree with this verse it's text but I have to tell you that this is most commonly looked at by being plucked out of the Bible and used totally out of context. Um, I can believe as hard as I want, and I'll give you an example. Years ago, this was in a different church, we had a men's group that met on Saturday mornings. <laughs> and one Saturday morning, this gentleman that had been a longtime member of the church walked in and said, Listen, boys, I need you to pray for me. Pray ardently for me. We said, oh, yeah, sure. What, what you need? I want you to pray that I win the lottery. I, wait a minute. I'm serious as a heart attack. I want you to, because I have a whole plan of all the good things God's calling me to do with that money. And I I left the room. And then screamed at the no, 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 I, I kind of inter He's improved. Yep. <laughs> I'm the new improved version. Um, but they, they went ahead and did that. But I said, anyway, because right here it says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Um, that is not what Jesus had in mind when he said this. Uh, and the New Age movement um, seeks to manipulate the external world. New Agers uh, believe that by the power of positive thinking, enough positivity, and they can make this world a place of peace and happiness. Um, I got news for you. I don't care if you're a New Ager or if you are the most ardent Christian that ever walked the face of the earth. You're not going to pray this world into something other than what it is. This world is a fallen world, and it will be fallen until Christ returns to, to make order out of it and to bring his peace upon society. And even then, after a thousand years, 
with Christ ruling his kingdom, there will be those apostates that have to be judged again and thrown in the lake of fire permanently with Satan. So even when Christ is here, there are going to be some sideways people that come along. So this is not going to happen. I uh, know, no, he did not. Um, and and I'll give you an example. And you can, maybe you even know of people that have done this, but um, a group of very ardent people once went to a uh, young man in a wheelchair and said, we're going to get you out of that wheelchair. We're going to get you out of that wheelchair because prayer can heal anything. Uh, you can move mountains with prayer. Um, so they all prayed over him. Never got out of that wheelchair. So they said, listen, what you need to do is you need to pray and come with us and conf confess your sins to the preacher. Then we'll all lay hands on you and that will get you out of the chair. Long story short, boy never got out of the wheelchair. And, well, and we will talk about this at a later time. I'm making a point here from Mark. Um, the power of prayer is indeed the strongest medicine that we have as a church. But there's one thing that we often forget in our prayers, and that is Jesus tells us if we pray in his will. If we are in line with God's will, what that means is God's already going to do what you're asking because it's in line with his will. He's already planned to do that anyway. What he wants the prayer for is to come into connection. What he wants the prayer for us, uh, what he wants the prayer for is for us to become more and more in line with his will. That's what it's all about. But we forget that part. Just like when, if my people will repent and pray, I will heal their land. We pray, but we forget the repent part. We forget that part. So, anyway. Um, I have just a really quick question. No, no, go ahead. When Danny talked about wanting to go down to North Carolina to go to school, I don't like change. Okay, I'm Amen. not a change person. So, and Danny sometimes has things on his mind and it's him, it's not God. Hmm. So I prayed to God, I said, if this is your will, I have to find a job in North Carolina that will pay for all our bills because all our bills go with us. Yeah. And he's not working. I have to find a job because I, I don't like meeting people because I get nervous, I mess up. So I need somebody, a place that I already know somebody, well, he's from North Carolina, how do I know <laughs> And a couple other things. But do you know that Danny got accepted to a school? I got a job at Duke's, and Duke was one of my customers. So the people I went to work for were the ones I was doing. You were doing work for. So I already knew all of them. Made yeah. enough money to cover our bills. And just like I said, so a couple other things. But it was his will for him to go to school. So mm -hmm. he showed us that that's. He'll work it out. Yeah. Um, and. I, I appreciate you sharing that, Sandra. And as far as Danny having things that seem good and not God's will, we all do that. Yeah. And we want it, so we kind of manipulate ourselves into thinking that God's telling us to do this. Um, but fortunately, if we are in a group like this, and in a compassionate, loving way, we hold each other accountable, Sooner or later, someone's going to say, are you really sure <laughs> that this is what you should be doing? And the church is called to do that. And when we know that someone that is, we believe, a true lover of Christ, and we know that in their personal lives there's something going on that shouldn't be, we're called to approach that person about it. Not in a, an indicting way, not in a, hey, what's wrong with you? But in a caring, compassionate, loving way. Where to go to, are you, I mean, I, I saw you the other day and was I, was I wrong? I mean, if I am, tell me and I'll step back, I, I'll, you know. But <laughs> if you love the person, you're going to tell them when they're heading for 
a, a train wreck. Anyway, enough on that. that. That's kind of a rabbit hole there. But, um, and uh, Brian, I want to talk to you about your next train wreck as soon as class is <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, you know, sometimes as Christians, we do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. and, and it's only when we let Jesus step into the situation that it resolved. The disciples would have done more harm than good to the Pharisees and to this family because they would have walked away and said, he's a fraud. Well, and... So for him to step in, and that's where we have to be careful. We have to know to, to say, okay, I have to step aside and let Christ be in this yeah. situation. And, and I, there, that's certainly true. Um, Having said that, we cannot avoid our scriptural responsibility to our brothers and our sisters. Um, but again, you're absolutely right. The biggest enemy of Christ is Christians. Selfishness. Um, Many times. Selfishness. Yeah. We think about ourselves often before we think of Jesus. Well, and even, even when we go to help someone, we think we're going to help them for their good, but we're helping them because we want to turn them into the way we want them to be. Anyway, um, in any event, as scripture, scripture proceeds in verse tw the second half of verse 24, it says, and, and I, I love this because it, well, let me just read it. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you have to throw yourself on your knees and go, look, I mean, I'm desperate. And I know you can do this, but I I, I probably, I don't have what I need to get it done. Whether it's faith or whatever the case may be, or your grace, or whatever it may be, uh, this father of this boy knew he, he was once again, like so many other people that we've talked about in Mark, was at his ropes end. This was it. Um, and I think many times that we say, I be Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, say we're praying for, uh, uh, and this is an ugly example, but i got to come up with one, someone with cancer that we know and love. And we, we Lord, please, you got to do this, and our loved one dies. And then we turn around and we say, God didn't part the waters when I wanted him to. He must not care. He doesn't love me. No, when you ask him to help my unbelief, that's also a way of saying, help me to accept your will. It's all about God's will. I've even, said it. Even Jesus on the cross, that was his will. Absolutely. And we're going to get to that. Very good. Thanks for the segue, Bill. This whole book is about God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not even about our salvation. That's the cherry on top that we get because of this and because God wants to show his glory by setting up a way for mankind to be reconciled to him. But the whole book is about God. Get over yourself. We have nothing to do with it. It's just we get it, we get it backwards. Um... Then we get into verse 25, which says, When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Um, Jesus here, if you look at that, he's not allowing the crowd to gather. When he does this, when he drives out this demon, it looks like he's trying to begin separating himself from the crowds because by this point I believe he realizes what the crowds want they want the like Herod later on during the trial um, remember the movie uh, or the uh, stage show Jesus Christ Superstar and when he gets in front of Herod and Herod's dancing around show me a miracle do something for me that's what the people are wanting um, and Jesus has shown them enough of that and I believe he's backing away from the crowds. And it says, The Spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. Maybe he was dead. 
We're not told here. He may have been dead. Jesus has raised the dead before. But in any event, um, there was not a crowd around. Uh, the demon made one last attack on the boy and then did what Jesus commanded him to do. Um, it said, verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. It's not clear whether the boy was actually dead or not. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him, and um, the boy was no longer troubled by the spirit and he did come back to life. Um, and the father's faith was solidified because Jesus had done what he said he would do. Um, in human relationships, it takes a long time to develop trust between people and only five minutes to destroy it. Uh, people let us down. They break our trust. Unfortunately, we sometimes project the mistrust um, that we experience in our relationships with other people onto God. Sometimes we stop trusting God. However, it's reasonable and rational, and I'm not going to give a philosophical treatise here. You're, you're welcome. I'll spare you that. But it's reasonable and rational to trust God. Indeed, if we go through the process, it is actually irrational to not trust God. Um, and we spoke about that about three years ago in our creation evolution class. Um, it's actually irrational for people not to follow the evidence that is plainly before us. Um, it goes on in verses 28 and 29. When he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but fair prayer and fasting. When the disciples were sent out two by two to preach and to heal and to cast out demons, I think they got the idea when they came back that they were kind of puffed up and they still, uh, still had that reservoir. It's like they had a gas tank on their backsides and it was full of, of uh, Christ's power, the Holy Spirit's power to do these things. Um, so without prayer, without even getting into a godly mindset, they tried to heal this boy. It's like I can see Peter um, sticking Andrew in the, uh, in the ribs with his elbow going, watch this, watch this. I got this one, boys, go ahead. And he couldn't do anything because he thought Peter was going to heal this boy. Peter ain't gonna do nothing. None of them are gonna do anything. And as a consequence, they failed. And what happens when we fail at something initially that we think we're going to ace? Well, if we lose all of our confidence, it drains right out of us. Because we studied, we know this, this is what I do for a living. I'm going to take care of this in five minutes time. And I go up and I completely fail. And fail, obviously, and fail mightily with total humiliation I'm going to back away if I can get lost in the crowd I'm going to get lost in the crowd and I'm going to let somebody else deal with it that's what happened with these guys and that's why Jesus said you guys still don't get it you still don't get it I'm the son of God and even when I'm here doing this stuff I'm not doing it in my power. I'm doing it through the Holy Spirit that is empowering me. What's with you guys? How long am I going to have to bear with you? Then we get into verses 30 to 41. Uh, any comments about the previous verses? And again, just shout out if you do. I'll go ahead and read these just for saving time. And besides, you guys, you leave me hanging all the time. So, <laughs> Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. Make note of that in the back of your minds. Then he came to Capernaum. 
And when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be the last and servant of all. Then he took a little child and said to him, and look, we're going to clear up some things through these verses. Because I, I got to, if you're like most people, I got a feeling you've had the wrong feeling about what these verses mean. Um, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Kind of dwell on those 11 verses for a moment. Because we're, we're going to turn a lot of it upside down. Jesus has left Caesarea Philippi, where a number of very important things happened. Um, Peter's confession that he was the Christ. Jesus' first announcement of his coming suffering and death. Um, the transfiguration. Uh, Jesus' rebuke of Peter. Um, the healing of the demon-possessed boy. All these things happened while he was there, and then they're going to pass through Galilee. Um, Jesus left the region around Caesarea Philippi and headed south back into Galilee. And this is the last time that Mark tells us of Jesus spending any time in Galilee. Um, and this is one of the times, I've made no secret, that my study Bible uh, is the New King James Version. And then when I have questions, I go back to the King James. This is not, I'm not selling Bibles here. Um, but this is the one time that I really do not like the King James Version or New King James Version translation. And I'll tell you why um, when I get to it. It seems Jesus sought to avoid the crowd so he could focus teaching his disciples at this point. Um, he returned to the message that he had given them that had shocked them so badly when he was in Caesarea Philippi. What was that message? that he was going to be arrested, he was going to be beaten within an inch of his life, he was going to be killed, but he was going to rise. And it was obvious in their reaction that it was the first part of that that the apostles focused on, the arrest, the beating, and the crucifixion. They didn't really understand that rising part because who had ever seen someone rise? They had. They'd seen Lazarus rise. They'd seen a little girl rise and probably may well be that little boy, but they still didn't get it. They were focused on what would impact them immediately or what they thought could impact them. So the thing that I don't like about the, new, uh, the King James Version translation is it's confusing here. It said the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. Now that word is Paravedive. Greek is paravedive. It means to be delivered up. Uh, it can mean betrayed, but it's not betrayed in the act of betraying. Okay, it means is betrayed, will be betrayed, is delivered up, will be delivered up. The King James Version makes it seem as though it's already going on. Now, in one sense, it is, because we talked about the covenant of salvation. Remember the covenant of salvation. Who was that between? The three, remember, the three persons of the Godhead. Okay? So, in that, re, in that respect, the betraying was ongoing from the beginning of time. But that's not what he's talking about here. So, that's why I don't like the translation. A lot of other translations are more appropriate when they say um, he is being delivered or he, is, he will be delivered up. Not he, is going to be. he is going to be. That is a more accurate translation. Um, because 
if he is in the act of being delivered here, Jesus is not omniscient here in his incarnation. Jesus doesn't know that Judas is going to be the one to betray him at this point. So who would be betraying him? God the Father. God the Father doesn't betray anybody. So that's how you can know right off the bat that this is a poor translation. That God would not be betraying his son. In fact, he can't be because it's the son's job to be betrayed by someone and to be arrested, beaten, and uh, crucified. So that is, how can we know that if we don't study the text? Okay, so that's, that's one of the places that um, I don't like the King James uh, Version. Um, but when Jesus, <laughs> think about this, the, the, um, the disciples had just thrown a collective aneurysm by hearing that Jesus, their, their king, that's going to give them a headship over all the provinces of Israel when he comes into his kingdom, is not in fact going to do that, but he's going to be killed. And as we mentioned, what usually happens to a would-be king's followers when the king is, they get removed as well. So they're freaked out about that. They kind of let it go kind of don't mention it anymore, and here Jesus brings it up again. Remember, boys, this is what's going to happen. So once again, they're faced with coming eyeball to eyeball with what he's saying. Jesus is making the point that he was being handed over or delivered, not at that very moment, but he would be. Um, again, when the covenant of salvation was formed between the three persons of the Godhead. God the Father planned it. Jesus the Son was going to be the working of it. And the Holy Spirit would be that which delivered the truth of it into our hearts and souls. Okay? Um, so then he gets to the point where their hopes have already been dashed about being a, a prince or something like that. Then he goes on to say, and when he was in the house, he said, what was it you, you disputed among yourselves? Well, obviously the boys were dumb enough. Now, as they were walking along the road, the ensuing text will tell us that Jesus must have had a pretty good idea of what they were talking about. When you're walking along and the dust is coming up off the road and everybody's kind of hot and tired, you can hear what goes on a mile away. You mothers, your kids never said anything in that house that you didn't hear, ever. Moms have bat hearing. I mean, they, they just do. Um, so Jesus, not through omniscience, because he is not omniscient in his incarnation, but through proximity and through having mama bat ears, knows, at least has the gist, of what the guys were talking about. Notice that when he asked them what they were talking about, they shut up, <coughs> and rightly so. Well, the first time he talked to them about his death and all, he rebuked them. <coughs> probably got afraid he's going to rebuke them again. Well, and rightly so, because think about it. This is tantamount to the kids sitting in the corner at the funeral home, arguing about how who's going to get mom and dad's money. How rude. Have you ever been in that environment? I have. Not in our family, because we never had any money. But with other funerals I've attended, where the brothers and sisters are all off in the corner talking, or maybe one brother won't sit with the others because they're having a feud about who's going to get what. Jesus has just told him what he is going to have to go through. Be beaten. Isaiah tells us he was beaten to where he was unrecognizable. Beaten, crucified, and buried. Just told that for the second time, and they're walking along trying to figure out who's going to be sitting at his right hand and who's going to be sitting at his left hand and have no compassion or concern, apparently, 
for their rabbi, their teacher, their friend, Jesus. None whatsoever. Do you think it's because they maybe it was so hard for them to believe that they could basically give him food? Kathy, I'll tell you the truth. I think they were just like us. Fallen creatures that only thought about what was in it for them. And I think that is largely why they initially followed him. Because if he was the Messiah, what they were viewing as the Messiah was going to pay off big time when he came into his kingdom. I, they never got, show me one place in scripture, show me one place in the book of Mark that we've gone over where the, the apostles got who Jesus was. Peter's confession, but, yeah, but. but I think Peter said it because he was prompted to say it because he's a really emotional guy. He was prompted in the moment to say it. I think God put the words in his mouth, but it was only to make a point because 30 seconds later, Jesus was re rebuking him for being Satan. <laughs> so how, how much of that did Peter really believe? Or even when he said, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah, he still thought the Messiah was going to have his kingdom here and Peter was going to be a great man. Now, here after all that, Jesus, it says Jesus sat down and called the boys to gather around him. He knows what they were talking about. And he knows what they had been thinking he was because that's what all the Pharisees thought. That's what all the normal Jews thought. That's what all the scribes thought, that the Messiah was going to come, defeat the Romans, set up a kingdom, and make Israel great again. That's what everyone thought. And Jesus sat him down and said, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last and servant of all. What hopes those guys had, if any, still left, were completely demolished when he says that. So I didn't come here to be served. I didn't come here for people to announce my greatness. I didn't come here to be a king over Solomon's temple and gold and, and women and a harem and horses and chariot. That's not what I'm here for, stupid. Or he, he's obviously better than I am. He didn't say that. But that's not what I'm here for. And guess what? That's not what you're for. And I am going to die. And so are you. The same way I did. Or the same way I do. And at that time, you'll get what I'm about. You'll get what I'm about. But up to this point, they didn't. Um, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last and servant of all. He turned the values and aspirations of all human beings upside down. Because Jesus was not just talking to these 12 dudes around the living room in this house. He was talking to every one of us who came to him after the fact. Over the centuries, over the last two millennia, anyone who accepts God's incredible grace, because would God be wrong in not saving any of us? I mean, and we're going to get to that in a minute. We don't run out of time this morning. Um, he would be perfectly righteous. He would remain perfectly holy if he condemned every one of us. But God, in his loving, sovereign nature, chose to save some of us. And people want to question. They want to question all the time. Who does God think he is? And I'm saying, listen to what you're saying. <laughs> Who does God think he is? Picking some and not picking all. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a word with him when I get up. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put in a good word for you when I see him. Look, and a lot of people don't like this. And we're not going to take the time to go through predestination and election 
and a lot of people don't like that, but it's scriptural. It's what the Bible says. And we're, we're not going to discuss that now. God's sovereign, and God is either sovereign or he isn't. And if God is sovereign, what can he do? Whatever he bloody well chooses. Whatever it, let me re rephrase that. Let me be philosophic, philosophic, theologically correct. Whatever in his nature he wants to do. And we'll save that argument for another day. Then, and this is another thing that we sometimes get wrong, or at least not totally correct. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Um, excluding those who uh, believe in uh, abortion on demand, most normal human beings consider babies adorable, a precious thing to be guarded and, and praise that God would bless you with such a thing. Now, when they turn 13, we change our minds for five or, five or six years, but then it all comes back around, so um, it works out for the best most of the time. But that's... God is not talking about little children here. And let me tell you why. Because back in that day, and this continued on through the um, 17th, 18th, and even into the 19th century, the mortality rate for infants was incredibly high. If I remember right, Peter the Great of Russia uh, in the 17th and early 18th century, he and Catherine had like nine children, only two of which lived. This was normal. So they're not going to set a baby up as the paragon of life and virtue because babies, yes, they were cared for, they were loved and all that, but they weren't really welcomed into the household until they got to be four or five years old and it looked like they were going to live and actually be part of the family. Sounds cold today, but that's how it was. And if you had lost seven of your children, you might feel the same way. You might be a little gun shy about getting too awfully attached to this baby until you know whether it was going to live or not. I'm just saying, it's human nature. Um, so when Jesus took the small child and set it between them or within them, he was telling them that you as apostles, you as disciples, are going to receive babies in Christ. These children that come to you because of the gospel, because of the word, are going to be infants. They're not going to understand. They're going to accept grace by faith, and then it's going to be up to you to nurture them and to feed them and to get them past that sudden infant, infant death syndrome or whatever you want to call it, that uh, reason that um, newborns pass away. In our case with the church, it's the reason that new Christians leave the church. It's up to you to feed them. And whoever of you gives as much as a cup of water to one of these new Christians, these babies in faith, these babies in Christ, they will not lose their reward. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking it's our responsibility to help people. Of course, only, only the Holy Spirit actually brings them to Christ. Well, only God brings them to Christ. The Holy Spirit enters the hearts and actually starts working on them so they can understand what they believe. But it's up to us, once they're here, to give them a reason to keep coming, to keep believing. And Mike, that's just as you so appropriately expressed it, that's why we need to be at the council meeting. Not because we don't want to go to lunch, all Baptists want to eat. Good numbers yeah. with food. That's right. But that's our job. And again, I'm, I'm going to make a 
statement here that maybe I shouldn't. I, I find it disappointing that we have to feed people to get them here. And it's become an anachronism that Baptists always show up for food. Just like we all sit on the back pew. That's exactly right. And, and that's just me. Don't misunderstand me. This is not an indictment. I just find it very disappointing that we have to put out glitter and bright lights to get people to come. But anyway, um, so having said that, I'm going to get you to sign up on the sheet, and we're not going to have food next Sunday. <laughs> Surprise! Surprise! Uh, no, I wouldn't live through that, probably. Okay, we, we've got to stop. Let me see if there's a good place to stop here. Um, no, because I want to take up this thing about um, other people casting out demons in Jesus' name that is not one of the twelve uh, next week, because there's a lot in that that uh, we don't want to rush over. Any questions, concerns? I've often thought these men that Jesus selected, that God selected, they were all Jewish. They were brought up in the Jewish faith and in, in, in their faith. None of them at this point were Old Testament strong, as far as I know. As you know. Yet there were rabbis that were waiting for the Messiah, and they possibly were waiting for a God-loving, God-sacrificial Messiah, too. God did not select them for the original 12. No, and we don't hear about them in Scripture. The closest thing we have is Nicodemus, mm -hmm. who goes to Christ, and but even Nicodemus, although he assisted with Joseph of Arimathea in the burial and so forth, there were those who honored Jesus as a good and wise rabbi as far as we know after the fact we don't hear of any of them coming to Christ as the Messiah after his ascension um, and I would think that if they're now the first Christians were Jews but who were the first Christians the poor the lame the injured the disparate the people that were outcast of society and Jesus showed us that example by the very people he healed in many cases he was the only person to touch a leper he went out to the lepers he went to the poor woman who had become poverty stricken and destitute because of a flow that she could not get cured um it may be but still i think that the i don't know this is not doctrine because it's not in the bible but those rabbis, even Nicodemus and uh, Joseph Arimathea, at least initially, were so indoctrinated, just like all Jews were, in what they taught and what they wanted to believe, that they couldn't tear themselves away completely from that tradition. Yet Isaiah 53 covers Christ on the cross. Exactly. So, uh, and it's all there. It's all there. They just had warped it. Um, to where just, just look at the Jewish nation now they're still looking oh, yeah. for as, that as type well, of uh, Savior well, and, mm -hmm. and in fact only the Orthodox the, the nation of Israel ain't looking for nothing except yeah. Egyptians creeping over the border yeah. and you do have the Messianic Jews too. yes and that's the reason why they say only about a third of the Jewish nation will survive yeah I mean they're not looking for Christ they're as secular a nation as you'll find on earth. Um, Mike, would you show us out, please? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the, the effort that David put into his message today, this morning, dear Lord, and the lesson. And Lord, open our hearts and our minds that we may become better servants to you. Dear Lord, let us apply it to our lives. And dear Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to come to your house. We pray for the service this morning and the message that Danny had. Dear Lord, uh, enlighten us and, and, and recharge us, dear Lord, that we can uh, live the lives you would have us live through the week. Dear Lord, we just thank you again for all your mercies, your grace, and your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, finish. I can't read it either.